Hello everyone. Uh, so this is the lecture capture for lecture one for Chem uh, 1001, uh, our chemistry course. And so what we uh, want to do with the lecture capture is give us give ourselves an opportunity to go back and uh, revisit material that maybe we don't understand or material we missed uh, during the lecture. And uh, this is a great way of doing that. So we're going to start in on chapter two with atoms. And the first thing that we wanted to ask ourselves is, uh, what is matter? Well, we can put it in a simple word. We can say that ad or matter is stuff. Uh, and a little bit more specific, we can say that it's stuff that has mass and takes up space. Now, that's not a really uh, great definition. So we're going to uh, get into this just a little bit more detail as we start to talk about atoms. Now, most matter that we have is fairly easily identifiable. For example, the chair that you're sitting on, the clothes you're wearing, or whatever you happen to be holding in your hand. Some matter, however, is not particularly easy, de easily detected. A uh, great example of that is air. It was a very long time before people realized that air had mass. And, uh, and all gases, for, for that matter, uh, sometimes they would have reactions that lost a gas and they, could, they would show that uh, matter was not conserved because it appeared that uh, matter actually went down during a gas evolution reaction. People didn't realize that the gas was leaving uh, into the atmosphere and therefore the reaction itself was losing mass. So uh, it kind of brings us to this point is during any kind of physical or chemical change, uh, the total mass of all of the matter that went into a reaction can't change. So however much mass went in, that's how much mass has to come out. Now, as we talk about atoms, we're actually going to get below the level of atoms, and we're going to get into subatomic particles. Now, for our subatomic particles, we often express their masses in terms of atomic mass units, or uh, just AMUs. And uh, how much does an AMU weigh? Well, we had to uh, create a relative measure for that. So we base the mass of the AMU on the mass of a carbon isotope, carbon-12. So one AMU is exactly one-twelfth of the mass of a carbon-12 atom. Uh, our um, particles sometimes have charges. We see that our, uh, our proton has a charge there, our electron has a charge there. Uh, so here we have our, our proton with a little positive charge on it and our electron with a negative charge on it and our neutron with no charge. And here we see the nucleus containing uh, both our protons and neutrons there. So as far as charges, uh, the charge of an electron is a minus one. Charge of a proton is a plus one, and these are relative charges. Uh, so we can look at their actual charges in terms of coulombs. We see that our proton is indeed positively charged, and it has a very small charge in coulombs, but it is something we're able to measure fairly accurately. We have our electron there that also has the exact same uh, magnitude of charge as the proton, but it has an opposite sign. And so uh, most often we're looking at charges in terms of the relative charge. So we would say a proton is plus one and an electron is minus one. And then the neutron, of course, has a charge of zero. We do have kind of our own language in terms of atoms. We have lots of ways of expressing uh, what isotopes we're looking at or which atom we're looking at. Uh, if we look at uh, um, a chemical symbol here, the, the full chemical symbol with all three of these uh, numbers on there, A, Z, and X. So X would be uh, the chemical symbol, so something like uh, our BE for beryllium might fit in there. Uh, our atomic number here is the number of protons. I'm just going to call those numbers of P's. Uh, so that's the number of protons, and you can take that directly from the periodic table. And then we have this thing over here called mass number, which we have as an A there. And uh, that is actually the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. And that is not something that you can get directly from the periodic table. You need to know uh, what isotope you're dealing with. And we can see that um, in that chart down below. Uh, if we look at something like our neon 20 there, 
Uh, so neon 20, uh, when we look at neon on the periodic table right here, we see it has a, an atomic number of 10, so that means it has 10 protons. Because we have uh, neon 20, and that is our uh, mass number there, uh, that means that we have 20 total protons and neutrons. So if I have 10 protons and 20 total particles in the nucleus, the remainder must be neutrons. So I must have 10 neutrons to get 20. We see then that for neon 21, we would have 11 neutrons. And for neon 22, we're going to have 12 neutrons. So we can't get the number of neutrons from the periodic table. We do need to know a little bit about uh, what isotope we're dealing with. Now if we look at uh, those masses of those neon uh, isotopes there, we saw that they all had a different mass. And yet when we look at the periodic table, we see that there's only one mass listed. So how do we report a single mass of an element when all of the isotopes of the elements have different masses? So what we need to do is find a way of averaging all of those different masses. Now we don't just use a straight average, we use something that's called a weighted average for all of the naturally occurring isotopes. And when we have a weighted average, that means that we take into account the percentage of each isotope. So what is the naturally occurring percentage for each isotope? We can use chlorine as a very good example. It has two isotopes. It has chlorine-35, which makes up almost 76% of all chlorine atoms, and chlorine-37, which makes up the remainder. So we can do our atomic mass calculation here. We convert our percentage that's here at 75.77. We turn that into a decimal at 0 .5, 0 0.7577. And then we have the mass of that particular isotope. We can take the percentage of the chlorine-37, turn it into a fraction, and then multiply it by the mass of chlorine-37. And when we work out that little bit of math, we get a value of 35.45 AMUs. And if you look at the periodic table, what you'll see is chlorine has an atomic mass of 35.45 AMUs. So that's an average mass of your sample uh, that you would have for any uh, sample of chlorine atoms. And here's one uh, that you can try. Uh, the video for this particular problem is on YouTube and you can find the link on Ilium and uh, you can go to a folder that says YouTube videos and when you click on that it'll take you to a folder in YouTube and uh, there's many different problems on there and this is one of them. So one of the more important units that we use in chemistry is something called a mole. Uh, a mole is really uh, the same thing as a dozen. It gives us a way of counting a very large number of items uh, just with using smaller numbers. And so, for example, 12, do 12 donuts is equal to one dozen. In the same way, we have 6.022 times 10 to the 23 donuts. It's a whole lot of donuts. Uh, that would give us one mole of donuts. So the value for a mole is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd in the same way that 12 is always equal to a dozen. We can have a mole of anything, but because the number is so large, it only makes sense to have that large number of something for things very small. And if we look at how we calculated that value, it's equal to the number of carbon-12 atoms in exactly 12 grams of carbon-12. But here's a question we kind of want to ask ourselves and we can have a little bit of fun with. How big is a mole, really? Well, if you had a mole of M&Ms, uh, you could actually cover the United States uh, to about a depth of 25 miles with a mole of M&Ms. If we had a mole of donuts, we could cover uh, the entire Earth to a depth of about 8 kilometers or about 5 miles. If we had a mole of basketballs, we could actually create a whole nother earth with just a mole of basketballs. And this is my favorite, who wants to be a millionaire? What if you were born with a mole of dollars? Well, if you had a mole of dollars, you could spend a billion dollars every second of your life. And then 200,000, roughly, uh, of, your, uh, of your kin could do the exact same thing. So that is a very very large number. And yet, if we think about 
how big a, a mole of water might be. What if I had a mole of water molecules? That would only take up about 18 milliliters of space, of volume. And so uh, molecules are very small and a mole is very large. One of the more common calculations that we do is to convert between mass and moles. Now, when we write our reactions, we can actually write them in terms of atoms or molecules reacting. That doesn't do us much good because we don't actually add simple atoms or molecules into a beaker. We add much larger amounts. So we can actually think of these numbers in terms of moles as well. Because what, what ends up happening is that an element's mass of one mole of that material in grams is equal to that atom's mass of that element in AMUs. So we can get that from the periodic table. Okay, and once we get that information, it becomes a conversion factor. Now, a conversion factor is any time you have something per something else. The most common way of stating uh, the uh, mass of an element or of a molecule is in terms of grams per mole. But we can also invert that and get one mole per the same number of grams. Even though numerically they look different, uh, symbolically they are exactly the same. It's just like saying that you have 12 eggs for every one dozen. You have one dozen for every 12 eggs. Even though one of those values is 12 over 1 and 1 is 1 over 12, numerically they look different. But what that means is that symbolically they are the same. Just some examples for you to try there on your own. So how do we use uh, our molar mass? And let's say we want to find uh, the number of moles of copper in a 35.8 gram copper sheet. Well, we want to write down what we have. So we have 35.8 grams of copper times, and if we look up copper on the periodic table, we see that we have 63.54 grams per one mole, or we can say that we have one mole per 63.54 grams. Now, we want this calculation uh, to end up as moles, so we want to have moles on the top. We want our grams to cancel, so we want our grams on the bottom. So, this is the conversion factor that we're going to want. So when we write one mole per 63.54 grams, you can see our grams cancel out. Let me change my color. Our grams cancel and just leaves us with moles. Okay, and I'll leave the math to you so you can see how that comes out. What if we go the other direction? What if we want to find grams, but we're given the number of moles? Well, we can do the same type of calculation. We have 0 0.473 moles of titanium. Let me look up my titanium here. We have 47.88 grams per one mole or one mole per 47.88 grams. Now in this example, uh, we want our moles to cancel and we want to be left with grams. So we want to use that first uh, conversion factor there. So we can go times 47.88 grams per one mole of titanium. And you can see that my moles of titanium will cancel and I can calculate a value there. There's lots of different ways of doing these calculations, so if you learned it in a different way, that's just fine. Now for molar mass, um, we express our molar mass of a particular compound in the units grams per mole, just like we did for an element. And uh, what we can do is just take the mass of all of the elements that are present in a compound and realize that if we just add up all of the molar masses, of all of those elements, then we can get the, the uh, total for a particular compound. So uh, what we do is take the number of atoms of the first element, 
times its atomic mass from the periodic table plus number of atoms of the second element times its molar mass. And we just do that until we've uh, calculated in all of the different elements that make up a compound. And once we do that, we end up with the molar mass of a compound. So as an example, we can do uh, NH3, ammonia. We see that we have one mole of nitrogen there from our formula, because there's only one nitrogen there. We look at the periodic table for nitrogen, and we have 14.077 grams per mole. We add that to the hydrogens, and we have three moles of hydrogen because of that three right there. And then the molar mass of hydrogen is 1.008 grams per mole. And when we add all that up, we get 17.031 grams. That should be per mole. Okay, so that's uh, that would be the molar mass of our ammonia. And here's an example for you to try uh, on your own. Uh, this uh, is also uh, put up on YouTube, so you can uh, take a look to see how it's done. Uh, for any of these problems that have a solution on YouTube, I do recommend that you try the problem on your own first, then go look at the solution. Now, anytime we're doing reactions, we need to make sure that we're balancing the reactions. Okay, so let's take a look at a reaction between H2 and I2. Okay, we're going to shrink ourselves down. We're just going to have a little bit of fun. Uh, we're going to shrink ourselves down to a molecular size and hop in our molecular-sized aircraft. We're going to fly around this reaction. So what would we see? Well, we've got uh, an H2 molecule, we've got an I2 molecule, and they are going to crash into each other. So when they do crash into each other, we've got a release of some energy, and what we see is that the hydrogen-hydrogen bond broke right there, and the iodine-iodine bond broke right there as well. And then we had a hydrogen-iodine bond form right there and another hydrogen-iodine bond form right there. Okay, now we want to know, is it balanced? And when we say a reaction is balanced, it means that I have the same number of atoms of one element going in as coming out in the products. So I can't lose atoms, I can't gain atoms. I have to have the same number of atoms of each element in both the reactants and the products. So we can take a look at this reaction not only as a drawing but also as a chemical reaction. And so we see that we have two hydrogen atoms here in the H2 molecule and I've got two hydrogen atoms there in my products. I've got two iodine atoms from the I2, and I've got two iodine atoms in my products as well. So we are balanced, and mass has been conserved. I've kept all of my atoms from the reactants, and they show up in the products. Let's take a look at, at an unbalanced example to see how we might balance a problem. So here we have two hydrogen atoms in the reactants and two oxygen atoms in the reactants. In the products, I have two hydrogen atoms and I've only got one oxygen atom, so that's not balanced. Okay, so we have to do something about that. We're not allowed to change the formulas of the reactants or the products, so we need to adjust how many of each species is present in order to balance. And what I mean by that is I can't just take my pencil here and put a 2 there and cause that to be H2O2. That would be bad. H2O2 is hydrogen peroxide. Very different compound. When you come in on a hot day, nothing better than a nice ice cold glass of water. Really refreshes you. An ice cold glass of hydrogen peroxide, yeah, that might kill you. So we really don't want to uh, change uh, the meaning of our reaction there. So let's go ahead and balance this reaction. So here we have our H2 and O2 going to H2O. We know that we need two oxygen atoms on the right, so to do that, we can get, we need to have two water molecules. So we're allowed to change the value here, out in front of that, uh, that molecule. So now when we check our balance, because now we have two oxygen atoms, so we should be balanced. Oh, unfortunately, by having that two in front of the water, we also change the number of hydrogen atoms. So now I, I balanced my oxygen atoms, 
but my hydrogen atoms are now out of balance. But that's okay. Uh, that happens a lot when we're doing these. I can actually balance my hydrogen atoms by putting a 2 in front of my H2. And now I've got four hydrogen atoms on both sides and two oxygen atoms on both sides. Now when we balance a reaction like that, we generally use what's called a trial and error balancing method called balance by inspection. And all that means is you keep trying, uh, making small adjustments as you go. If the numbers start to get too big, that probably means that you've made a mistake somewhere and you need to take another look at, uh, at your numbers, maybe even start over. Well, here's a couple that we can try. We've got C6H14 plus O2 going to CO2 plus H2O. I just like to balance these going from left to right. And so, actually, I think this one is, uh, is online as a, uh, as a video, so I'm not going to balance it here. And here's another one that I've got online. Uh, B2, B2O3 plus NaOH goes to Na3BO3 plus H2O. So give both of those a try on your own, and then check the video to see if you get the coefficients correct. Now, when we're doing reactions, a lot of time what we're worried about is how much material have we put in and how much material are we getting out of the reaction. We call that relationship stoichiometry. And stoichiometry is a term that relates amount of stuff in to the amount of stuff that comes out, our reactants versus our products. You can think of it just like you might in cooking. It's our values in a recipe. How much do I need to put into a particular recipe to get a particular amount out? So if we know how much material we're putting in, using stoichiometry, we can figure out how much product we're going to get out. So here's just a quick example initially of uh, a filling for cream cheese or a cheesecake. So if you take five eggs and three blocks of cream cheese and a cup of sugar, that should give you a filling for one cheesecake. If I wanted enough filling for two cheesecakes, I would just need to multiply everything by two in my reactants. I don't need to change my balanced reaction. I just need to know how to get those relations between them. Well, the same thing goes for a regular chemical reaction. Down below, we have the uh, chemical reaction for the formation of ammonia. So we have 3H2 plus N2 going to 2NH3. And there's lots of different conversion factors that we can make. Before we even look at those, we can see that we can do some of these conversions in our head. So if we had like 5 moles of N2, how much NH3 would we be able to make? And since for every one N2 that we put in, we get 2 NH3 out. If I put in 5 moles of N2, hopefully you can see that we should get 10 moles of NH3 out. You did that one in your head, and it's good to remember that because these calculations aren't particularly difficult, just need to keep straight which conversion factors you want to use. Here are three of the conversion factors of the six that we have for this particular reaction. And it gives the stoichiometric relationship between each of the products and reactants. Notice that the values in front of each particular reactant or product matches what we see for the balancing coefficient in the balanced reaction. I mentioned that these are three of the, co uh, three of the uh, stoichiometric relationships. The other three relationships come from inverting each of these. And they become conversion factors, and you can always flip a conversion factor. Now when we're doing a reaction, a lot of times our reactants are not added in exact amounts. And there's a variety of reasons for that that we're not going to get into. But if they're not in exact amounts, that means one of those is going to run out first and one is going to be present in excess. Usually what we want to find is which of those is going to run out first. And the reason we want to do that is because it's called a limiting reactant and it controls the amount of product. It limits the amount of product is a good way to think about it. Let's go back to that NH3 reaction that we just saw. Let's say we had 10 grams of H2, 10 grams of N2. How much ammonia could we produce? We can't just look at the amounts of H2 and N2 and say, well, we're going to get 20 grams. Reactions don't work that way. We need to check to see if we have a limiting reactant. Now, because we have an amount of two different reactants given, it's usually a good assumption that we have a limiting reactant problem and we're going to have to figure out which of those is going to give out first. 
So the first thing we want to do is we want to convert both of our reactants to moles. So here we convert our H2 to moles, and we get 4.975 moles of H2. We get 10 grams of N2. We convert that to moles. We get 0.357 moles of N2. Now, we can't just look at the number of moles of each of those elements and say, well, the N2 is present in a lesser amount, so it's the limiting reactant. And the reason we can't say that is because the N2 and the H2 are used up at different amounts or at different rates because of the balancing coefficients. So we need to see which reactant's going to run out first by comparing the rates at which they're used. And we can use the stoichiometry for that. So for N2, it has a balancing coefficient of 1, so we can think of it as using 1 mole of N2 for every reaction that goes. So we divide the number of moles of N2 that we got here and put that here, and we end up with 0.3571 reactions. We can carry out the reaction 0.3571 times. It's okay that it's a decimal. Don't think too much about that. For our H2, we take our 4.975, we divide that by a 3. Okay, we use that 3 there because we have a 3 coefficient for, uh, for the H2. When we divide that, we get 1.658. Because our nitrogen has a smaller number, it is my limiting reactant. This is the only thing that we use these values for, is to compare to each other and figure out which one is the limiting reactant. Okay, so now we're going to use the moles of N2 for the rest of our calculation, and we can ignore the H2. So using the N2, we have moles of N2. We can use the stoichiometric relationship between NH3 and N2 to calculate number of moles of NH3. And once we got the moles of NH3, we can use the molar mass to convert to grams of NH3. So when we do that, we get 12.1 grams of ammonia. Notice we don't get 20 out, even though we had 10 grams of each in. Okay, this is a fairly complicated problem, but notice that everything we did is nothing more than a series of conversion factors. And so it's very important to keep in mind as you go through here. You can do the conversion factors easily enough. You just need to know which one you're going to do. Unit analysis becomes very important here. If you can get from one unit to the final unit and do it with a proper unit analysis, chances are you've done the problem correctly. Now, in a perfect world, when we do a reaction like that, uh, we get all the product that we would expect. This, however, rarely occurs. The example I like to use is with uh, cookie dough. If you make a recipe with cookie dough or if you buy tube cookie dough, it usually says you should get a certain amount of cookies out. However, we all know that we snack on the cookie dough as we're making the cookies and we don't get as many cookies as we're supposed to. Now, I don't recommend snacking on the chemicals when you're working on a reaction. Uh, however, other things can happen that keep your uh, chemical reaction from going all the way to completion. If we look at that previous problem with the ammonia, we saw that if we added 10 grams of N2, 10 grams of H2, we should get 12.1 grams of NH3. That 12.1 grams has a term, and it's called the theoretical yield. That's the amount of material we should get out. Well, let's say that we do the reaction, and we only got 7.8 grams of ammonia out. This is called the actual yield. Well, what happened? Well, we're not going to get into what could have happened, but something chemically happened that prevented us from getting all 12.1 grams out. That 7.8 grams, again, is called an actual yield, and it must be determined experimentally. You cannot calculate what an actual yield should be. And so to get the percent yield, we take the actual yield of what we got, divide that by the theoretical yield of what we expected to get, we multiply that by 100%, and we get 64.4%. That's not a bad value, it just is what it is. Some reactions are very low, below 10%. Some reactions are very high, above 90%. It just depends on the reaction and the conditions. And here's one for you to try a little bit later. Uh, the video for this particular uh, problem is posted up on the YouTube uh, set. And so try this one out and then check yourself to see if you get the right answer.
Now in chemistry, we do a lot with solutions. It's kind of what people think about when they think of chemistry usually is uh, uh, solutions of different colors or whatever. Uh, but a lot of them have uh, a very uh, uh, common similarity between them, and that's that most of those solutions have water as a solvent. When water is a solvent, uh, we call those solutions aqueous solutions or aqueous solutions. We use water very frequently uh, because it's a very good solvent. What makes it a good solvent is it is a uh, very polar molecule, which means it reacts very well with ionic compounds. And these are our salts, and a lot of what we're dissolving are going to be salts. And so those two things uh, interact very well and makes uh, dissolving a lot of those salts uh, energetically favorable. Now when we're making solutions, we don't just want to throw in any old amount of our solute in there. So we need some way of expressing how much solute is actually present in a solution. How much material do we have dissolved in there? Well, we use the term molarity uh, by far most often. So it's a very common way of expressing concentration. And molarity is actually the moles of solute divided by the liters of solution. Notice that this is liters of solution and not liters of solvent. Okay, so liters of solution includes both the solvent and the solute present in that solution. So, uh, as an example, if you went down to a storeroom or a stockroom and you saw that we had 0.37 molar, it's how we say molarity with a capital M, molar, uh, nitric acid solution, uh, it means that for every liter of that solution, we should have 0.37 moles of HNO3 present in that liter. Now, when we have uh, molarity, notice that we do have two units there. We have moles of solute per liters of solution. And any time we have something per something else, it can be a conversion factor between those two, those two units. So molarity becomes a conversion factor between moles and volume. It also means that we have a lot of relationships set up between molarity, volume, and the number of moles. And we're going to use that here in just a little bit. So here's just an example for you to take a look at. Uh, let's say I take uh, 0.38 grams of sodium nitrate. I dissolve that uh, in some water to make 50 milliliters of solution. We want to know what would the solution's concentration be in moles per liter or molarity. Well, I don't have the units that I need for molarity, but we do know how to get that. We're given grams of sodium nitrate. We can convert that into moles of our solute. We have 50 milliliters of solution. Uh, notice that our molarity needs liters of solution, so we just need to convert that to liters. And I'll put here, we need to convert that into moles. And so once we've got the moles of our solute and the liters of our solution, we can divide those properly and find the molarity. So we mentioned that molarity can be used as a conversion factor. Uh, we can use it uh, to find how much solute we need for a particular concentration. Um, we can figure out how much is in a particular volume of a known molarity solution. Okay, so we've mentioned it can be used to convert between volume and moles. Once we find volume and moles, we can then move that to a moles to grams conversion. Let's take a look at an example here. So how many milliliters of a 1.5 molar sodium chloride solution are needed to get 100 grams of sodium chloride? We know how many grams we want. We want 100 grams. But in order to get grams, we first need to find moles because moles are a unit in that 1.5 molar NaCl. Grams are not a unit. Once I find the moles, I can use the molarity and the moles and use that relationship to find the volume. Once I find the volume, I can convert that volume into proper units if any uh, further conversion needs to be done. Let's look at that one as an example. So here we're going to turn our grams of sodium chloride into moles of sodium chloride. I've got 58.44 grams per mole. That's just the molar mass of sodium chloride. I get that uh, by adding sodium and chlorine together on the periodic table. So I have 1.7111 moles sodium chloride. I want to turn that into a volume. So in order to get 1.711 moles of sodium chloride, I see that I need one liter 
of solution for every, to get 1.5 liters of sodium chloride. Okay, and that comes from the concentration of the solution. So it turns out I need a little bit more than one liter. If, if one liter gives me 1.5, then to get 1.7, I need a little bit more than that, and that's exactly what my calculation shows. If I wanted that in milliliters, which is a common unit that we measure in, we just convert our liters to milliliters and we get 1,141. If we want to do uh, reactions with uh, uh, all in solution form, all in a, in a liquid form, uh, then we need to do some stoichiometry there. Now the last time we saw stoichiometry, we converted a solid material in grams, converted that to moles. We converted the moles of that to moles of something else, and then we turned moles back into grams. Well, we can do a similar thing. However, uh, we don't have grams for our solutions. We have molarity. So we can go from uh, volume to moles using the uh, solution concentration in molarity. And we can do the same thing here to go from moles to volume using the concentration in molarity. Okay, you just need to make sure that you're using the uh, conversion factor properly because you've got moles per liter. You can also go liters per mole. Now sometimes when we're going to make a solution, uh, many of the chemicals that we want to make into uh, a solution or use as a solution in the lab need to be made more dilute than what we buy. Many of the materials we buy, especially uh, some of our stronger acids, get bought in a very concentrated form. And the form that we want to use them in needs to be more dilute. So what we want to do is calculate how much of that concentrated solution we need so that when we dilute it to the volume we want, will have the final concentration we want. Well, we can manipulate our molarity equation. We see that we have um, our molarity is equal to moles over volume in liters. If I move that volume over here, multiply both sides by volume, I now have volume times molarity is equal to moles. So if we think of our solution, uh, we're going to take a certain volume out of a concentrated solution and put that into a beaker. And then I'm just going to add water to that beaker to dilute it. I would, haven't changed the number of moles of that material because all I've done is added water to it. I have to change the concentration of it, but I haven't changed the number of moles. So what that means is that the initial number of moles of the material that I'm trying to dilute is going to be equal to the final number of moles that I'm diluting. The only difference is the volume of the solution that they reside in. So, in order to get our moles, we can calculate moles just like we did here as volume times molarity. So, the volume times the molarity of my initial solution is equal to the volume times the molarity of my final solution. So, a lot of times we say it is MIVI equals MFVF, or we can also say M1V1 is equal to M2V2. Very easy equation to use and very handy in the lab. One of the more common reactions that we like to do in the lab, they're kind of fun, are precipitation reactions. Precipitation reactions occur when you take two solutions, mix them together, and you get a solid. Let's say we combine a solution of lead nitrate and sodium iodide. We want to ask ourselves what ions are formed. Well, in the initial solution, we have lead and nitrate in the lead nitrate solution, and we have sodium and iodide in the sodium iodide solution. What ions can combine? Well, we're not going to combine lead and sodium because they're both positively charged. Same is true for nitrate and iodide. Okay, we know that the lead and the nitrate aren't going to combine because they were from one of the original solutions. Same for the sodium and the iodide, so we know those aren't going to combine. So the only ones that combine by swapping partners are the lead and the iodide, the sodium, and the nitrate. 
So we use our precipitation tables or our solubility tables, uh, which is table 4.1 in your book, to see if uh, we're going to get a precipitate. So the possible precipitates are sodium combining with nitrate and lead combining with iodide. What we see with sodium and nitrate is that both of those always make a soluble compound. There's no possible way to combine sodium with something or nitrate with something and get a precipitate. Now with lead and iodide, uh, the rules that we see apply to the iodide ion, and we see that most iodide uh, compounds are soluble, so they won't form a precipitate. However, there are some exceptions, and iodine combining with lead 2 plus is one of those exceptions. And so lead and iodide get together and form that lead iodide precipitate. And we see that here in this very pretty yellow color coming down in the, uh, in the beaker. You do have to be careful with the chemical formulas uh, when you're determining what the precipitate's going to be. Notice that my iodide here has a minus one charge. The lead has a two plus charge. And so we do have to have two iodides to balance out the charge with the lead. Now, since we got a precipitate forming, we call this a precipitation reaction. Now, where'd the other ions go? The sodium and the nitrate. They're still in the solution. Okay, the solubility rule said that sodium compounds or nitrate compounds are all soluble. So what that means is if I put those into solution, they're going to dissolve. What that also means is that those ions cannot come together with anything and form precipitate. So they remain in solution, and we call them spectator ions. In other words, what they do is they sit around and watch the reaction happen. We use those uh, types of ions very common. Uh, very commonly in precipitation reactions because they are able to go into solution and dissolve and dissociate and bring in those other ions uh, into solution. So they don't take part in the reaction itself, but they do help us bring other ions uh, into a reaction that can be a little bit difficult. So they continue to be dissolved in solution. If I were to evaporate all of the water out of that solution, then I would get sodium nitrate crystals once all the water is gone. Now we can write that particular reaction three different ways. We can write any precipitation reaction three different ways. We can write it uh, like this, where everything is present in a molecular form. We call that a molecular equation. Notice that we've written all of our substances as molecules, as if they are still together. Even though we saw in the beaker the lead and the nitrate are completely apart, as well as the sodium and the iodide, we still write it in their molecular form. We know that they're ionic because we've written a Q afterwards, that little aqueous, and that means that we know that those are dissolved. They're dissociated in solution as ions. The same goes for our sodium nitrate here. One thing that's written a little bit differently is our lead iodide. We saw that the lead iodide formed a precipitate, which means it's a solid, and so we keep that as a solid. So this is called a molecular equation or complete molecular equation. We can also write our, um, all our components as, as they actually are in that solution. Okay, so we see that our lead and our nitrate are dissociated here. Our sodium and our iodide are completely dissociated there. Notice that the lead iodide is still together as a solid because it's not out in solution floating around, and our sodium nitrate is also present there okay as aqueous ions so this is called a complete ionic equation where we've written everything that is ionic in its ionic form now the last one is what's called a net ionic and a net ionic has all of the spectator ions left out the easiest way to find those is just see are there ions that are present in both the, rea the reactants and the products? And if there are, we cross them out. So we've got two nitrates in the products, we've got two nitrate ions in the reactants, so they get crossed out. We've got two sodium ions in the reactants, two sodium ions in the products, so we cross them out as well. And all I'm left with is the lead 2 plus aqueous plus two iodide ions aqueous going to lead iodide solid.
So that's a net ionic rea reaction, net ionic equation. This shows the actual chemistry that took place during that reaction. And here's an example for you to try. Uh, you want to write the molecular reaction or equation, complete ionic equation, and the net ionic equation for this precipitation reaction. One of the things you're going to have to do here is to figure out what actually precipitates by using the solubility tables in your book. The answer for this is in one of the YouTube videos. Now, no talk about solutions would be complete without talking about acids and bases. Some acids are substances that give a lot of foods a sour taste. Okay? Other acids are industrial. Some of the acids that give food a sour taste are phosphoric acid, citric acid, and some others. Now, they're called acids because they produce an H+, plus, or more correctly, a hydronium ion, H3O+, plus, in solution. When an H+, plus is freed from a compound, it actually grabs onto the H2O that it's, that's in the solution with it and becomes H3O+. Plus. You can often identify an acid because the H will be listed first in the formula such as HCl or HNO3. But this is not a hard and fast rule, and you will find acids that do not list the H first. We also have bases that form hydroxide ions, OH minus ions, in solution. These substances tend to taste bitter, and they're most often found with a metal. So we have an OH minus compound, a hydroxide compound, or a hydroxide ion, rather, combined with a group 1 or group 2 metal. So as an example, we have sodium hydroxide and calcium hydroxide. A lot of times we'll refer to our acids and our bases as being strong or weak. Now when we do that, we're not referring to their strength as to what they can dissolve or what they can't dissolve. When we use the terms weak and strong, referring to their strength as an electrolyte. Something that's a strong electrolyte dissociates completely in solution. So if you have an intact crystal and you put it into water, the crystal is completely dissociated. All of the ions dissociate from each other. They're called electrolytes because it can, can conduct electricity. So strong electrolytes conduct electricity very well. So a strong acid means that it's a strong electrolyte with acid properties. We also have weak electrolytes. Now, weak electrolytes do still conduct electricity, but they don't conduct very much because they're dissociated very little in solution. So most of the molecules that you would put into solution remain intact. Uh, some of them have come apart into their ions, but not very many of them. So we call those weak electrolytes because they very weakly conduct electricity. So if we have a weak acid, that means that we have a weak electrolyte with acid properties. And the same goes for strong bases and weak bases. The most common thing we do with acids and bases is a reaction called a neutralization reaction. And this occurs when the H plus from an acid and the OH minus from a base react and form water. So if we wrote the net ionic reaction for most acid-base neutralization reactions, this is what we would get. H plus plus OH minus goes to H2O. We also get a salt. Uh, the salt is usually soluble, but not always. In the example you see over there uh, on the right, we have sodiums and chlorides in there. But sodium chloride is a soluble salt, so we don't get any kind of precipitate. It would be possible to have an acid-base uh, neutralization reaction also become a precipitation reaction, but we try not to do that. Now, when we're doing an acid-base neutralization reaction, uh, we uh, very frequently do something called volumetric analysis. And this is where we're doing a quantitative measure of the concentration of an acid in the base. We do this with a technique called titration. And we use an indicator to show when the titration is done. An indicator is another chemical that changes color at a very specific strength of acid, or pH. Once it changes color, we say that we have reached an equivalence point. At the equivalence point, the amount of acid and the amount of base is equal. And once I know that, I can find the concentration of either one of the acids or one of the bases that I'm using. So here's just as an example, 
Uh, we see here in the top we've got lots of base. Down here in the bottom we've got lots of acid. As I add base to the, to, to the acid there, they combine with the OH- ions and make water. And once all of the H plus ions are used up in there, uh, then we've reached a pH where a particular indicator is going to want to turn color. In this case, it turned pink. Uh, it happens very quickly uh, as you're adding just fractions of a drop out of, uh, out of this piece of glassware called a burette, and uh, it works very well. So here's an example uh, that we've done using uh, HCl and sodium hydroxide. Uh, we have 30 milliliters of 0.2 molar NaOH, and the titration requires 42.32 milliliters of NaOH. What is the concentration of the HCl? Well, we've said that the moles of one has to equal moles of the other, so we know that the moles OH minus must equal the moles of H plus, and as we saw earlier with dilution method, we know that moles are equal to volume times the molarity. So the volume of my base times the molarity of my base must equal the volume of my acid times the volume of my acid. And so the volume of the base was 48.32 milliliters. And the concentration of the base was 0 0.200 molar. So that's got to be equal my acid. So the volume of the acid was 30.00 milliliters. And what I don't know is the molarity of my HCl. I actually don't have that one worked out, and it's not present as a video because I missed this one. I will try to get it posted as a video, and... Uh, and you can see the molarity there. But work this one out on your own and see what you get for that calculation. Yeah, so we missed a lot of these in here. I apologize for that. So here's our oxidation reduction reactions. If we go back and look at the reactions that we've done so far, most of our reactions have just had ions exchanging partners. In an oxidation reduction reaction what we have is electrons changing partners. We're moving electrons as opposed to moving ions. So here's an example here. If we take iron and copper sulfate, we get iron sulfate and copper solid out. It doesn't look like much of a reaction until you remove the sulfate as a spectator ion. What we see is that the iron goes from being a solid to being an ion, so it must have lost two electrons to go from no charge to a two plus charge. Those electrons had to go somewhere. The copper went from being a two plus ion to being a copper piece of metal, copper solid, so it had to gain two electrons to do that. So the electrons left the iron and went to the copper ion. So in order to track the movement of electrons, we use a concept called oxidation numbers or oxidation states. The way we assign our oxidation states is follows these set of rules. Now there's lots of different ways of doing this. Just as, this is a, a set of rules that I've used for a long time and I find that it works really well. We'll just go through these here. If you find a species that's in an elemental form, it's going to have an oxidation state of zero. A good way to spot something in an elemental form is you have uh, an element that's all by itself with no other elements with it and it has no charge on it. If that's the case, it's usually an elemental form. If you find uh, any oxygens in any of the compounds, then we're going to assign it a minus 2. The only uh, exception here is if you have a peroxide, where you have two oxygens bound to each other, and then they both have a minus 1 oxidation state. Those are pretty rare. The oxidation state of any hydrogen present in a compound is a plus 1. The oxidation state of any group 1A elements, so lithium, sodium, potassium, etc., we're going to give those a plus 1. The oxidation state of any group 2A elements, we're going to give a plus 2. If we have any monatomic ions, we're going to give it an oxidation state equal to its charge. A monatomic ion would be a singular ion by itself, something like sodium plus. 
There's nothing attached to it, but it has a charge. And then we can check some things, because this does not cover all the elements by any means. So as you look at a compound, we have to realize that the sum of the oxidation states in a compound has to be equal to the charge on either the polyatomic ion or on the molecule. If it's a molecule that has no charge, then the sum of the oxidation states has to be zero. If it's something like a phosphate ion, PO4, with a three minus charge, then the sum of the oxidation states has to add up to minus three. And rule eight, the oxidation state of halides, so bromine, chlorine, uh, iodine, is usually a minus one. Now the most important thing about these rules is that you must apply them in order. You go from one to eight. And that means that you don't apply rule eight unless you have to after rule number seven. Because something like chlorine could have an oxidation state of minus one. It could be plus one. It could be plus three, plus five, or even plus seven. So you would find that in rule number seven. But every once in a while, you will come upon a compound where two of the elements are not known. And now you have a single equation with two unknowns, and you can't find uh, any values there. These do take a little bit, little bit of experience, and they do take some practice. So uh, you can go ahead and try some of those out of the, uh, the chapter. So here's a reaction example. Calcium plus chlorine goes to calcium chloride, CaCl2. We want to know, is this a redox reaction? Well, if we go through and assign oxidation states, if we have anything in a, ox in a uh, uh, elemental state, the answer is yes. We have our calcium with a zero. We have our chlorine in a zero because those are the elemental states of calcium and chlorine. Do we have any group 1A metals? The answer is no. Do we have any group 2A metals present in a compound? The answer is yes, we have calcium, a plus two. And then we, get, we have no monatomic ions. So we know that calcium and chlorine have to add up to zero because calcium chloride has no charge. So the sum total of my chlorides must be a minus two. I've got two chlorines in there, and so each of them must be a minus one. I see that my calcium changed oxidation states and my chlorine changed oxidation states, so that means I have a redox reaction. So we applied the rules in order. We see that elements changed oxidation state, and that means that we have a redox reaction. Now we use the term redox, and we always go together. And that's because when something is oxidized, something has to be reduced. Okay, so those processes have to go hand in hand. There's no such thing as a reduction reaction. There's no such thing as an oxidation reaction. You can have half reactions of those, but those two things always have to go together to make a whole reaction. So how do we label which of these is which? Well, when something is oxidized, it loses electrons. We see that the calcium went from a zero to a plus two. And so that means that it lost two electrons. So the calcium in this example was oxidized. When something is reduced, it gains electrons. We see that the chlorine went from a zero to a minus one. So to go from zero to minus one, you have to gain electrons. So the chlorine is reduced. We have a mnemonic here, a couple mnemonics to try to, to try to help us remember this. Oil rig, oxidation is the loss of electrons, and reduction is the gain of electrons. Or we can say that Leo goes grr, which means that the loss of electrons is oxidation, the gain of electrons is reduction. Just choose one of those and always use it. They are exactly the same, it just depends on which one you prefer. So we can refer to species as being oxidized or being reduced, but we can also refer to them as agents. A species that is oxidized means that it caused something else to be reduced, so we call that the reducing agent. In this example, we see that the iron went from a zero oxidation state to a plus two oxidation state, so it lost electrons. So it was oxidized, but that means that it made the copper get reduced. So we call it 
a reducing agent. Okay. Conversely, the copper gained electrons. So in order to gain electrons, it had to have taken them from something. So it made something else lose electrons, which means it made something else get oxidized. So the Cu2 plus would be called the oxidizing agent. You're, you're reducing and oxidizing agents, and what gets oxidized and what gets reduced are always reactants. The products are just the result of those actions. Well, that finishes out uh, the number of slides that we got through uh, for lecture one. Uh, if you have any questions on any of the material that we went over on this lecture, uh, make sure you review the textbook through the, those pages. You can rewatch this, or you can always send me an email or come in and chat with me to clear anything up. I hope this helps. Good luck.